Lecture 25, Keeping Warm. This is the first lecture in Module 5, whose title is Fire and Ice. And as the title of Module 5, Fire and Ice, and the title of this lecture, Keeping Warm, both imply this module is about heat and related phenomena. Let's take a look, as we have with the other modules, at a quick outline of what we're going to be doing in the six lectures that comprise this module. The first lecture is called Keeping Warm. I'll say a little bit more about what it's going to do in just a minute. Um, lecture 26 is Life in the Greenhouse. That's going to talk particularly about Earth's climate, how Earth's climate is established, and how we human beings may be changing Earth's climate. Lecture 27, The Tip of the Iceberg, talks about changes in state between liquids, solids, gases, and how they affect different substances. And <clears throat> will answer the question, which I hinted at before in my lecture on taking flight, of all things, uh, why it is that the iceberg floats with most of its mass submerged. In fact, why the iceberg floats at all, which is a remarkable question. So we'll look at changes of state of materials with changes in temperature and generally thermal conditions. Uh, physics in the kitchen. I love to cook. Um, the kitchen is full of examples of physics. Heat transfer occurs. We cook things with microwave ovens. We need to know how to get an egg just right. Um, we need to explore different cooking techniques. How is baking different from broiling, different from boiling, different from steaming? I love double boilers because they cook egg custards, particularly tapioca, to perfection. How does that work? We'll look at physics in the kitchen. Lecture 29 is like a work of Shakespeare. Um, am I going to talk about the thermodynamics of sonnets? Am I going to talk about Hamlet's temperature? What am I going to talk about there? Like a work of Shakespeare is a quote from the British writer C.P. Snow, and I'll leave it at that till we get to lecture 29. And finally, lecture 30, energy in your life. We'll talk about our selves as creatures in 21st century industrialized society and the amount of energy that it takes to supply us with our energy needs. We got a hint of that several lectures ago when we had somebody cranking, it was Jamie, cranking away on that hand crank generator. We'll bring that out once again and we'll talk about how much energy is actually used in your name and where that energy comes from. As that last lecture's title hints, energy and thermal phenomena, temperature and heat, are closely related. Well, this is lecture 25, Keeping Warm. And as the title suggests, we're going to be talking about how it is that systems keep at the particular temperatures they're at. Um, we human beings, in particular, uh, are able to exist in only a relatively narrow range of temperatures. We can survive only over a few tens of degrees Fahrenheit, and we're comfortable only over a very narrow range of a few degrees to 10 degrees or so Fahrenheit. Um, we're very restricted as to our comfortable temperature ranges. How do we manage to keep warm? How do we keep our buildings warm? How does our planet keep warm? How does a greenhouse keep warm? How do natural systems keep warm? What determines the temperature of the sun? What determines the temperature at the filament of a light bulb? How do things keep warm? Those are the kinds of questions we're answering in this lecture. Let me begin with some definitions. We sort of talk loosely about heat. I want to be a little more precise with the definition of heat than you probably are in your everyday life. Um, we sort of think of heat, and I've suggested this before, as referring to kind of random motions of the molecules that make up a substance. And I argued before that, for example, when I do something like step on the brakes in my car, provided it's not a hybrid car that's regeneratively braking using the law of induction and putting that energy back into the battery, but if it's an ordinary car with friction brakes, what we're doing is turning the directed forward motion of the car into this random motion of the molecules that we call loosely heat. And I've always used that word loosely because that is not quite the definition of heat. Strictly speaking, that energy associated with the random motion of molecules should be called internal energy. It's energy that's internal to a system. It isn't associated with the bulk motion of a system. It's internal to the system in the sense that it belongs to the individual particles, the individual atoms and molecules that make up that system. So what we tend to think of as heat, I say, here's a bathtub full of hot water. It's got a lot of heat in it. I really shouldn't say that. It's got a lot of thermal energy. What's heat then? Heat has a very specific meaning in physics. It means energy that's in transition, going from one place to another, and not just any energy that's in transition. For example, the energy that is flowing down an electrical wire to bring power to my laptop computer right now, that's not heat. Heat is energy that's flowing because there's a temperature difference between two things or two places. 
And when there's a temperature difference between two things and two places, or two places, energy tends to flow from one to the other, and the energy flowing as a result of the temperature difference is called heat. Once the energy gets into the other substance, it's then, strictly speaking, internal energy. And you may say, why am I quibbling with words like this? And the answer is an important one. If I have a bathtub full of cold water, and I make it hot. One way to make it hot would be to put it in contact with a hot object. I could dump a, a, a hot block of stone into it. I heat up a stone in a fire and dump it in the bathtub, and the bathtub would warm up because the stone is hotter than the bath water, and energy would flow as a result of that temperature difference. But I could equally I'll take that bathtub and put my hand in it and agitate it vigorously, supplying energy and turning that energy by friction into the internal energy. My hand is not significantly hotter than the bathtub. Maybe it's even cooler. It's not transferring energy by virtue of a temperature difference by, by another means. But the end result is the same. The bathtub is at a higher temperature, and it has more internal energy. Heat refers to energy that is in transition specifically because of a temperature difference. Now, I've talked about temperature differences. What on earth is temperature? Well, temperature is actually a fairly simple thing in the easiest physics definition. It gets pretty complicated in more complicated definition. But in the simplest definition, temperature is simply basically a measure of the average energy, the average internal energy that individual molecules have. Now you have to be a little bit careful with that definition. It's most accurate for gases, simple dilute gases like the atmosphere around me, but it basically applies. What temperature is basically measuring is how much of that internal jiggling energy there is on average. You increase that energy, you've increased the temperature. Now there's a whole range of internal energies, of internal speeds of the particles that are, say, whizzing around in this room at speeds on the order of 300 meters a second, but some of them are going 1,000 meters a second, and some of them are going 10 meters a second. But the average speed is around 300, and that's also close to the speed you're most likely to find. So temperature is a measure of the energy, ultimately the kinetic energy of the molecules as they whiz around. So we have heat, which describes uh, how much total energy, internal energy, energy associated with these random emotions there is in something. I'm sorry, not heat. Heat's the energy flowing. Internal energy is that total amount of energy in the substance. Heat is energy that flows from one thing to another as a result of a temperature difference. And temperature is a measure of the average amount of energy in the molecules of a substance, and the average amount of internal energy, the internal energy per molecule. So they're all measuring slightly different things. How do we measure temperature? Well, temperature, unfortunately, like the meter-kilogram system of units that we invented to do uh, electricity and magnetism, is really the temperature scales we have really aren't quite as natural as they might be. Because temperature is a measure of energy, and because systems have a minimum amount of energy they can possibly have, you might think that minimum is zero, but because of quantum physics, it isn't quite zero, but it's tiny. There is actually a minimum temperature that a system can have, and that temperature is called absolute zero. So if we had been smart, and physicists who work with thermal effects particularly are smart enough to use this, this system of temperature, we would use a temperature system based on absolute zero. But that's not the temperature system we use. We tend to use, in the United States, the Fahrenheit scale for temperature. And I have here a picture that shows, as horizontal lines, the uh, temperatures, representing the temperatures at which various phenomena occur. Um, at the very bottom is absolute zero. You cannot go lower than that. It's like the bottom of a swimming pool. You can't have any less water than taking it all out. Um, there's a temperature fairly close to absolute zero at which nitrogen boils. In later lectures in this module, I'm going to be working with liquid nitrogen, and it's going to be at about that temperature. Much higher than that is the temperature at which ice melts, and higher still is the temperature at which water boils. On our Fahrenheit scale, uh, 212 is the boiling point of water. 32 is the freezing point of water, the melting point of ice. On that scale, nitrogen happens to boil at about minus 321 degrees Fahrenheit, and absolute zero occurs at about minus 460 Fahrenheit. Most other countries in the United States and most scientists who don't have to use the absolute zero scale, for instance, a biologist talking about what's the best temperature to incubate these cells, We'll typically use the Celsius scale. And the Celsius scale is quite similar to the Fahrenheit scale in that it doesn't have its zero at absolute zero. On either of these scales, zero degrees doesn't really mean there's zero of something. It's just an arbitrary point on the scale. 
At my home in Vermont last winter, it got to 20 below zero many times. There's nothing magic about that negative temperature. We're still way above the true absolute zero. That's just an arbitrary point on an arbitrary scale. The Celsius scale is a little bit more rational in that the melting point of ice, the freezing point of water, is zero degrees Celsius. The boiling point is 100 degrees higher. At 100 degrees Celsius, nitrogen happens to boil or liquefy, depending on which way you're going, at almost minus 200 Celsius, and absolute zero is minus 273. Neither of these scales is the best to use. The actual official system international, international system of units temperature scale is the Kelvin scale. On the Kelvin scale, absolute zero is zero Kelvins. And by the way, if you want to sound very sophisticated, you say degrees Celsius, degrees Fahrenheit, but Kelvins are an official international system unit, and you just say Kelvin. So if you hear a physicist saying, oh, the sun's at 6,000 degrees Kelvin, you can say, ah, you're not quite using the right terminology. The sun is at 6,000 Kelvins. And water boils at 273 kelvins, uh, and water vaporizes. I'm sorry, did I say boils? Water melts, ice melts at 273 kelvins. Uh, water boils at 373 kelvins, 100 degrees higher, 100 kelvins higher, or 100 degrees Celsius higher. Um, nitrogen boils or liquefies at 77 kelvins, and absolute zero is, as it should be, zero kelvins. Notice that there are 100 degrees between the boiling point of water down to the melting point of ice in the Celsius scale, and there are 100 kelvins from the boiling point of, of water down to the melting point of ice. That same 100 difference means that a degree Celsius change is the same as a, as a Kelvin change. A Kelvin and a degree Celsius have the same size. The only difference between those two scales is the zero point. Whereas a Fahrenheit the Fahrenheit scale is quite different. The, the degree size is different, and the uh, zero point is also different. Um, there's one fourth scale I'll just mention. Unless you're an engineer, you've probably never heard of this scale and have no reason to. But engineers who deal with things like power plants need to work in absolute temperatures. And so engineers in the United States at least use the Rankine scale, in which a degree Rankine is the same as a degree Fahrenheit in size, but the zero point has been correctly put at absolute zero, and on that scale, ice melts at 492 degrees ranking, and bo water boils at 672 degrees ranking. And we'll see in subsequent lectures, particularly that one about Shakespeare, just why it is that we need these temperature scales that begin at zero, particularly when we're talking about things like power plants and engines and things like that. Now, I should mention that we are rarely interested in the absolute amount of energy in um, some warm substance. For instance, again, go back to my bathtub of warm water. I don't really care how much total energy is in there. The Shakespeare lecture is going to give us a better reason why that is, but one reason is it turns out to be impossible to get all that energy out, even if you would like to. What we're usually more concerned with is how much energy does it take to change the temperature of a substance or an object by a given amount? And that number is called the object's heat capacity. The bigger the heat capacity, the more energy the object can absorb without changing its temperature very much. Water happens to be a substance with an enormous heat capacity um, compared to most other substances, or very large anyway. And that's why it takes water a very long time to boil when you put it on the stove. It takes quite a bit of energy to raise the temperature of water from tap water temperature up to that boiling point of 212 Fahrenheit or 100 Celsius. It takes a long time to do that because it takes a lot of energy coming in from your stove to do that. It's also why large lakes, like the Great Lakes, exert moderating effects, or the ocean, exert moderating effects on the climate around them, because it takes a long time for those temperatures to change, and so they act like temperature-stabilizing regions, and regions near large bodies of water tend to experience less extreme temperature changes, at least as long as those bodies of water are unfrozen. Now, I've indicated the heat is temperature is, is the flow of energy resulting from a temperature difference. So when an object's temperature differs from its surroundings, heat will flow either into the object if it's cooler than its surroundings or away from the object if it's warmer from its surroundings, and that is properly called heat. And there are three mechanisms whereby energy is transferred by heat, or to put it more succinctly, three different heat transfer mechanisms that are important to understand if we're going to answer the question that's implied in the title of this lecture, namely, how do we keep things warm? The commonest mechanism is conduction. It occurs when you simply place two objects in direct contact with each other, and what happens is, in the hotter object, particles are moving a little faster. They collide with slower-moving particles in the attached cooler object, and they transfer their energy. Think back to the last 
lecture in the module on motion, in module two, I showed you some collisions of two carts, and I put different masses on them, and when one object was moving faster and hitting a slower moving object, energy got transferred to it. I similarly bounced a couple balls, a tennis ball off of a kickball. That kind of collision occurs at the microscopic level, and for the objects that are moving faster, the molecules in the hotter substance, energy gets transferred to the cooler substance, and that's the mechanism of heat transfer. And different substances, again, are better conductors of heat, better at causing this heat conduction to take place. Um, metals happen to be very good conductors of heat, and it's for the same reason, basically, that they're good conductors of electricity. They have a lot of free electrons. Those free electrons are lightweight. They easily respond to collisions with a, or, 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 or a warmer region of a piece of metal, and they quickly move, and they transfer that energy to other parts of the substance. So a metal, if you heat up one part of it, quickly becomes hot all over. If you uh, stick a, a, a hot poker in the fire and leave it there very long, you can't even touch the, the metal parts of it that are far out of the fire because metals are very good heat conductors for the same reason they're um, good electrical conductors. Water is a moderately good conductor. Air, with its widely separated molecules, tends to be a relatively poor conductor of heat. And materials like styrofoam or fiberglass insulation uh, manage to trap heat. And I have a piece of, of, of styrofoam over here that's been cut open. You can see the little bubble-like structure in it. They happen to trap heat um, because they stop heat flow because they have little trapped air bubbles. And air is a relatively good insulator. And so basically heat doesn't move easily through styrofoam because of those little bubbles of air, which are very poor conductors of heat. Um, now, I usually like to avoid the non-metric units. You notice I've been trying to talk about meters here, and I would tend to talk about Celsius degrees and things like that, because those are the units scientists use. But I do want to say something about one unit that's worth knowing about, and that's the so-called R factor used in measuring insulation effectiveness. Over here, I have a piece of styrofoam blue board. This is commonly used to insulate basements, for example. It's put applied to the outside of basement walls before a new home is backfilled. Styrofoam has the property that has an R value, which I've designated by this script R here, of six per inch. Now that R value has meaning. This is one and a half inch thick styrofoam, so it's got an R value of 7.5 total. That R value has meaning, or rather the inverse of that R value, one over that R value has a specific meaning in terms of English units. And here's what it means. One over 7.5, if you do the math, arithmetic, is about 0.13, a little more than a tenth. The units of that, which we rarely give, if you go to your construction yard and buy some insulation and say, what's the R value? Oh, this is six inch fiberglass, R19. Ask them what the units are. They won't be able to tell you probably, but it does have units. And the units are British thermal units. That's a unit of energy. It's the amount of energy it takes to raise the temperature of a pound of water by one degree Fahrenheit. It's analogous to the calorie, which is the amount it takes to raise a gram of water one degree Celsius. British thermal unit used in the United States, not in Britain, per hour, per degree temperature difference between the two sides of the styrofoam per square foot. So what that means is if I have one square foot of this styrofoam insulation and the temperature difference between the inside and the outside is one degree Fahrenheit, then every hour this will lose 0.13 BTUs of energy. If I have many, many square feet in my walls, I multiply by how many square feet I have. If it's 68 degrees Fahrenheit inside my house and it's zero degrees Fahrenheit outside in the winter, then I multiply by 68 degrees for that difference. And that number is what allows, say, the, the plumber or heating specialist who's sizing a new furnace for your new house to calculate how much heat output that furnace has to be capable of. Because they can calculate from the value, R values of your insulation what the energy loss rate is. So that's what that R value in insulation is all about. And in fact, R values simply add, so they're very useful uh, numbers to deal with. Um, by the way, people are often asking me, should I turn down my my thermostat at night. Uh, does it make sense to do that, um, or doesn't it just take more energy to heat up in the morning? And the answer is obvious if you think about it. So think about it. Okay? Why is the answer obvious? Because the rate of heat loss depends on the temperature difference. So if my house cools down at night, the heat loss rate is going to be lower. And I'm not going to have to overcompensate for that to bring the heat up in the morning. So that's conduction. And that's important, one of the important things in determining energy loss from our houses. Another heat loss mechanism is convection. Convection is the transfer of energy by the bulk motion of a fluid, and it's responsible for a number of common energy, uh, energy transfer mechanisms. For example, uh, heat flow by convection, here's a 
symbolic picture of a pot of water on the stove. The stove burner is red hot. There's heat transfer by conduction into the water, but then the warmed water becomes less dense and it rises in the middle and it sinks in the edges and it sets up these patterns of circulation, convection cells they're called, that are what are ultimately transferring energy from the bottom of the water to the top of the water. That's a very common convection, convective heat flow. Convective heat flows, if you have a radiator in your house, that heats the air and that sets up a convective air circulation, transferring heat around around the room, for example. And convection is also important in a number of natural systems. Here's a picture on the left of uh, looking down on convection cells in, in a laboratory, and they form these very remarkable, distinct hexagonal patterns. The middle of these cells is where the warm fluid is rising. Those boundaries, those hexagonal boundaries, is where the cool fluid is falling, having transferred its energy to whatever's at the top of this picture. Uh, Here's a picture of the sun taken through a special telescope. Um, the sun has convection going on to transfer energy from its interior to its surface. And this is actually a movie. And if I get the movie started, you can see those convection. So this is actually the boiling motion churning on the surface of the sun. Let's run that again. There's the surface of the sun, the churning convective motions as the... Uh, convection occurs inside the sun and brings that boiling fluid to the top. It's not boiling, but it's moving in these convective motions. It's not a liquid, it's a gas in the case of the sun. Um, a much slower version of natural convection occurs inside the earth. Below the crust of the earth is the semi-plasticish mantle. You can think about it as a very, very thick viscous fluid. There's heat rising from the interior of the earth from the primordial heat from when earth was formed and also from radioactive decay. That sup sets up convection currents in the mantle. They run very slowly on time scales of hundreds of millions of years, tens of millions to hundreds of millions of years, and that's what drives continental drift. For instance, the North Atlantic Ocean is opening fundamentally due to convection patterns like this that are carrying Europe and America apart at about the rate that your fingernail grows. Not immeasurable. We can actually measure it with, among other things, the global positioning system that I will talk about in a later um, lecture. By the way, um, I mentioned that air is a poor conductor of heat and therefore a good insulator, but it isn't good enough just to make, say, a double pane window with a wide gap between them because um, if you have air, air readily sets up convection currents and those convection currents can carry heat even if air isn't a very good conductor. That's again why we use insulation like fiberglass and styrofoam because those little bubbles inhibit the convective motions of the air and then we get the true insulating value of the air because we've suppressed the convection. Finally, let me mention an energy loss mechanism that here on Earth tends to be important only at very high temperatures. It's the way a hot a wood stove sends much of its energy into the room, for example, or a light bulb filament. And that's radiation. That's the transfer of energy by electromagnetic waves. Uh, because all objects involve vibrating molecules and atoms, and they have electric charges, they represent accelerated electric charges. And we saw in the last lecture of Module 3, accelerated charges are what produce electromagnetic radiation. So something like a hot stove burner emits electromagnetic radiation that becomes visible for you to see. Um, Shiny objects reflect radiation, so shiny objects can block the flow of radiation. Here's a thermos bottle. If you look inside the thermos bottle, vacuum bottle, you see it's shiny on the inside. That's to suppress any energy loss from radiation. In addition, there's a vacuum between the inner and outer walls of these containers, and conduction and convection can't occur in a vacuum because there's no materials to handle the conduction or convection. So the thermos bottle effectively suppresses virtually all energy loss from what you put in it. That's why it's so smart that it, if you put cold stuff in, it stays cold, and hot stuff in, and it stays hot. That's also why some very high-quality windows you might buy for a new house are called low-E windows. They actually uh, block the flow of infrared radiation that your house would tend to emit. The hotter an object gets, the more electromagnetic radiation it emits. And something else happens too. And that something else is that the color of the radiation changes. Here I have an example of that. Here I have a light bulb with a bare filament. You can see it. It's not a frosted light bulb like most of the light bulbs you use. And I have it connected to this device, which is actually a variable auto transformer, which uses, again, Faraday's law of induction to provide a variable voltage to this light bulb. And as I turn the light bulb up, first, not much happens, but there is electric current flowing through it, but you just don't see anything happening. But as I turn it up more, it begins to glow, first a dull red. It's not emitting much radiation, and the radiation it's emitting is primarily not that red color, but actually infrared that I can't see. But as I turn it up more, two things happen. It emits more radiation, 
And by the way, the amount of radiation he emits goes up very rapidly as the fourth power of the absolute temperature. So if I double the temperature in kelvins or ranking, not from 10 to 20 Fahrenheit, but from 100 to 200 or 200 to 400 kelvins, I will multiply the amount of radiation by 2 to the 4th or 16-fold. So it goes up very rapidly with increasing temperature. And furthermore, you'll see the light is getting yellower and yellower and yellower and yellower. More and more of it is coming out now as visible light. More and more and more visible light. More light, more light. And it's getting whiter and whiter and whiter and whiter. I'm actually exceeding the design voltage of this lamp, so it may not last long. And there it is, white hot light. The temperature of that filament is reflected in the color of the light it emits. Um, the sun, for example, is white hot. It's at 6,000 degrees Celsius, about the same as 6,000 kelvins, because there's only a few hundred degrees difference in the zero point. Um, the filament of a typical light bulb, not when I had that all cranked up, is about 3,000 kelvins, about 3,000 degrees Celsius. Um, I had that cranked all the way up. It was almost the same temperature as the surface of the sun, probably. And I can tell that because it was glowing with about the same white kind of temperature. Now, I want to end with an important concept, which we'll use more of in the next chapter. Um, if I have a hot object and I have no additional energy to it, for instance, this light bulb, and I turn off the power so there's no energy source, it quickly cools down. Why? Because it loses energy to its surroundings. And if I don't want it to lose energy, I have to keep supplying it at a steady rate with new energy. If I don't want its temperature to change, it will always lose energy, but I'm replacing that lost energy and maintaining a constant temperature. And that's the key to maintaining constant temperature. That's the key to keeping warm. You want to balance the energy loss that naturally occurs with any energy supplied to the system. In things like buildings, we have thermostats that turn the furnace on and off to achieve that balance. In our brains, we have a hypothalamus that senses our body temperature and it does things like causing us to sweat more or in certain animals it raises the fur or shuts down the fur or ruffles the feathers or whatever in such a way that that affects the energy loss rate and tries to maintain or it increases our metabolic rate to change the energy input to keep us at the same temperature. Um, even without some active mechanism like that, though, objects naturally seek a certain temperature. Um, and an example I want to give you to end with here is the example of a, a solar heated greenhouse. And before I do, let me just give you this, the, the general conceptual framework for this idea of energy balance. Heat flow depends on temperature differences. If you're too hot, the heat flow increases. Well, then there's more cooling. If you're too cool, the heat flow decreases, resulting in a warming. So an object ultimately will come into balance at a constant temperature if the energy input to that object or system remains constant. What that, what that temperature is depends on how rapidly the object can exchange heat with its surroundings. And as an example, here's a greenhouse. Okay? And this greenhouse is going to be in balance. It's cold outside, but the greenhouse can still be warm inside. Why? Because energy is coming into the greenhouse from the sun, and energy is going out of the greenhouse at an equal rate. And that rate is determined by the material of which the walls are made, how well the glass is double layered to be insulated, and so on. Exactly what that warmer temperature will be is determined by the properties of the greenhouse, how it's been designed. But the point is, in balance, the rate at which energy is coming into that greenhouse, in this case, sunlight, is exactly balanced by the rate at which the energy is going out to the cooler environment. And you might say, wow, there must be some very complicated computerized heating system to get that balance just right. Nonsense. There's nothing like that. This happens completely automatically. What if it were too cool in the greenhouse? What if you opened the door for a while and left it open, and then you said, oh, the door's open, and you closed it? Well, now the greenhouse is cool. What does that mean? Because it's cool, it's not at a very big temperature difference from its surroundings, so the rate at which energy flows out is relatively small. But the rate at which energy is coming in from the sun is still large, and that means there's a net input of energy to the system. Its internal energy is going up, and its temperature is a measure of that internal energy, and therefore the temperature goes up. On the other hand, if it's too hot in the greenhouse, say 100 people go in there and do aerobics for a while, and their body heat and so on make it too hot in the greenhouse, well, then the greenhouse is much warmer than its surroundings, and the rate of heat flow depends on the temperature difference, just as it did for my styrofoam slab there. And therefore, the energy flowing out flows out at a greater rate than it's coming in from the sun, and that results in a loss of energy, and the greenhouse cools down. And eventually it finds itself at an equilibrium temperature, which is determined by the rate at which energy is coming in and by the rate at which it's losing energy through, through its walls. 
That's what determines the equilibrium temperature. Same is true of the filament of this light bulb. This light bulb is surrounded by the room, and right now I'm dumping into it. It's a 200-watt light bulb. I'm putting into it 200 watts of electrical energy. And it quickly reaches the right temperature so that it is hot enough compared to its surroundings that it is radiating energy also at the rate of 200 watts, and then it achieves its equilibrium temperature. If it's too cool, um, it's getting more energy in than going out, it warms up. If it's too hot, it's radiating more energy than is coming in, and it cools down, and it achieves a balance. The sun is at 6,000 kelvins because the energy input to the surface of the sun from the nuclear reactions at its core is exactly balanced by the energy radiated away from the sun into space. And again, there's not some complicated mechanism that achieves that. It simply happens naturally. The system comes into energy balance because the energy loss rate, the rate of heat flow, depends on that temperature difference. And that kind of energy balance is the ultimate determinant of Earth's climate, and that will be the topic of the next lecture.